Okay, I'm delighted now to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Chenin Bao, who is the KK Lee Professor in Chemical Engineering. Professor Bao is one of the most forward-thinking and innovative researchers that I know, and I'm honored to, to be one of her collaborators. She is leading the revolution of next generation medical devices. In January this year, Professor Bao was the Honorable Laureate of the inaugural VIN Future Special Prize for Female Innovators. Through this prize and many others, she was recognized for the advanced development of skin-inspired wearable electronics and their application in a range of medical and energy applications, including in mental health. Her research offers, offers hope to millions of people living with disabilities and with the stresses of mental health disorders. Join me in welcoming Professor Bao to the podium. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Liam, for the uh, kind invitation to speak here. I had the pleasure to uh, collaborate with Lian and uh, also Carl Desroff uh, for uh, quite a number of years. And uh, I myself, as a chemical engineer, uh, my goal or dream is to, uh, to build an electronic skin. Uh, that's what you see here. Uh, this is a basically a uh, synthetic skin that mimics all the functions of human skin, uh, sensing, signal processing, and also interfacing with our nerve system so that our brain can interpret the signal that comes from uh, the synthetic skin. But what we're thinking is that with this huge engineering challenge, if we are able to build it, then we will be able to learn a lot of useful information about engineering, about materials development, and about how to interface electronics with human being. And then that will, in turn, allow us to build wearables and implantables that we hope to be able to treat or diagnose disease in early stage and uh, be able to contribute to uh, different areas uh, of uh, medical research and treatment. So mental health uh, is an area that we're very uh, passionate about because of family members and um, uh, friends uh, I know who suffer from it. Um, but I did not know as an uh, a engineer, uh, I'm trying to switch it. Okay. I did not know as an engineer uh, until six or seven years ago when I started collaborating with Lian that the state of art for determining mental health or uh, depression is by uh, just doctor interviewing patient to get the symptoms. And uh, as an engineer, I cannot imagine that uh, uh, if we want to be able to quantify any state of person's health, uh, such as uh, something uh, that a lot of people are suffering, diabetes, uh, there is the blood sugar level measurement that can be carried out so that the patient knows uh, when to use insulin or how to control their diet. Uh, but there's no such thing uh, of a measurement tool that can quantify which type of um, uh, depression the person has. Is it anxiety or is it uh, depression? Um, and uh, through this interaction, with uh, Lian, uh, I also learned that uh, there are a lot of uh, ongoing work using advanced tools uh, such as uh, fMRI to scan the brain to try to determine the subtypes uh, of or biotypes uh, of uh, depression so that the appropriate um, medication can be prescribed. There are also um, uh, devices uh, such as EEG uh, that are being used to also to map the brain, uh, but the ones that are non-invasive are either very, very bulky or uh, they're, they're too simplistic, just not 
are able to measure enough information to allow doctors uh, or psychiatrists to make a decision on the type of medication to prescribe. So our interest in this area and our goal is to be able to develop non-invasive devices, wearables, um, uh, and also to advance um, uh, implantable devices so that we can use these more uh, newer developed uh, engineering tools to help to understand correlations between certain quantifiable parameters to mental health. And uh, we call this kind of device the wearable version, a mentate, uh, that is wearable for uh, mental health. And with the uh, mentate, we hope to be able to work with uh, psychiatrists uh, uh, such as Lian and Kao to uh, be able to validate these wearables uh, and uh, eventually be able to use them to quantify uh, mental health state. So in my talk, um, I like to, uh, I started with the current challenges and the, the background. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the challenges we face. And I'll tell you about some of the advancements uh, we have been working on related to uh, developing skin inspired sensors for electrical signal measurement and uh, neurochemical measurements. And these are tools we hope to initially use to help to understand uh, the, um, uh, the, the neurological uh, connections uh, between um, uh, brain and uh, uh, mental health. And then uh, I'll also talk about, and eventually they will be developed into uh, more human-friendly, uh, non-invasive um, uh, tools. And then uh, the second part will be mainly about the wearable system that we're uh, building uh, towards quantifying mental health. So I already mentioned wearables currently, uh, they are not offering useful information, but those which can offer useful information, they are too bulky and not available for everyday usage. So our goal is to really make, kind of bridge the two parts and make such electronics or wearables to be comfortable, invisible, imperceptible, biocompatible, and autonomous. So as I mentioned, uh, in my group, we develop um, uh, sensors and electronic circuits uh, toward this overarching goal of uh, building uh, electronic skin. Uh, so there are two parts that are important for all the wearables. Um, uh, the lower part is the sensor. Uh, we started uh, first by mimicking the sense of touch of human skin, uh, and uh, that led to uh, nowadays uh, developing chemical sensors and uh, electrophysiology sensors. Uh, but we started from uh, mimicking sense of touch. And uh, there we collaborated uh, uh, actually with uh, Kyle Desroff, uh, who helped us uh, to validate our sensors uh, uh, in terms of the electrical signal they can generate and use that uh, to stimulate animal brain uh, to see the uh, response in the animal. Um, and then uh, along the way, uh, as I mentioned, we want to make all these um, uh, sensors and the electronic skin to be truly human skin-like. And those type of electronic materials and the integrated circuits uh, uh, did not exist before. We have silicon devices, we have microprocessors, but they are all made with rigid and brittle material. Uh, so we have been developing the fundamental understanding of the chemistry, physics, and the engineering for uh, several decades now. And our breakthrough is really um, uh, almost uh, uh, 10 years ago that we discovered that there is way to make 
soft materials to have um, uh, electronic property on par with that of silicon devices. So then now we start to build integrated circuits with the new materials uh, that we develop. Uh, and then the circuits and the sensors, they are merging together to allow us to build our uh, most recent version of electronic skin that's truly skin-like uh, and uh, is able to generate signal that uh, controls motor movement uh, in the animals. So that's um, uh, the basic things we are uh, engineering uh, that we're developing. But coming back to measuring electrical signal, uh, this is what's uh, currently being used for the uh, medical grade EEG. Uh, you see the electrodes. Uh, these are uh, hard metal-based uh, electrodes. And in order, of course, it would not make intimate contact uh, with uh, human skin. Uh, so then you won't be able to get the very, very fine signal uh, from the, uh, uh, from, from the uh, head. And in that case, uh, doctor needs to put in uh, some saline solution or gels uh, so that uh, the uh, electrode can make contact uh, with, the, um, uh, with the skin uh, to allow signal extraction. So the challenge is really uh, to make soft electrodes that are both as soft as our human skin that I mentioned, but also having electrical conductivity that's getting close to that of metal electrode, then that would be the type of electrode we can use not only for measuring uh, the fine electrical signal from our brain, from our heart, from our muscle. Uh, these could also be soft electrodes uh, that we can potentially implant inside the body without causing damage uh, to our soft tissue. Uh, so that's what we have been working on uh, for quite a number of years. And uh, now we have electrodes uh, that are uh, very conductive, uh, getting very close to that of um, uh, metal electrodes. Uh, I show some chemistry here because I'm very proud of the chemistry that, that we do that eventually allowed this to, uh, to happen. Uh, actually, there are two parts of the molecules. Uh, the, uh, on the right part, the molecules are the molecules that conduct electricity. And on the left side are the molecules. Uh, you see little kind of circles. So those are rings uh, that can slide against another molecule that thread through a thread through, through those little rings. And these rings uh, have anchoring parts uh, that uh, would uh, form a network and embed our conducting uh, polymer to be in this matrix. And when we have movement, it will cause strain to the material, to the electrode material that we make. Uh, if it's metal, of course, it cannot stretch. Uh, it will constrain our movement. You will feel it. And it's also very hard and rigid. But if it's with these molecules, the ring can slide against each other, against the thread, and it dissipates mechanical energy. As a result, our conducting polymer electrode is very soft, similar uh, level of modulus uh, as our skin. And also at the same time, uh, it can stretch without breaking and keeping the electrical conductivity. Uh, this is the most conductive uh, conducting polymer that's out there and also stretching uh, at the same time. Uh, previously, there are conductive polymers or plastics uh, available, but you can't stretch them. If you stretch them, you also break them. Uh, this is the first time we are able to really get soft electrodes, so that's extremely high conductivity. And the other um, uh, benefit from these kinds of electrodes compared to metal um, is that when we use them to interface 
with the um, human body, when we try to extract electrical signal from the human body, uh, I plot here you, uh, the, the plot on the right. It's the impedance. Um, uh, when we interface electrode with um, uh, tissue, the impedance basically is the resistance that uh, it takes for uh, electrical signal to travel through this um, uh, uh, kind of, you can imagine it, it's, it's not a really a vacuum. There is this material in between the skin and the electrode, but the electron has to travel across between the skin to into our material in order for us to measure that electrical signal. So if it takes a lot of resistance for the electron to get into our device, then the signal you measure will be very, very weak. Uh, but with conducting polymer, because of their unique properties, um, uh, unique electrical property that's very different from that of metal, uh, they can have several orders of magnitude lower resistance for the uh, charges to travel across to our devices. So what's the implication? The implication is that we, using these electrodes, not only they don't constrain the movement, but instead we can also have much smaller electrode, finer electrode, higher resolution electrodes to be able to measure signal even down to cellular level. And also, this can allow us to perform electrical stimulation. We uh, have seen that 10 times lower amount of voltage that we need uh, to apply to cause the same uh, movement uh, to, to legs or to hand when we stimulate the nerve. Uh, so there are not only the mechanical property is important, but also the uh, electrical uh, performance is important. Um, so using this material, now we are able to, um, uh, to show that we can make uh, really high resolution electrode arrays for stimulation and the recording. Uh, here we have this soft array we implant in places where it wasn't possible before uh, using metal electrode. For example, on the left uh, in the mouse, we implant the electrode into the brain stem region. That's where the uh, brain and the spinal cord intersect, and it's near our neck. So when, when the animal moves the neck, then it will cause um, uh, uh, potentially mechanical damage to the brain if we have any hard object uh, inserted in that region. Uh, but here with our soft electrodes, it doesn't cause that damage. And also at the same time, uh, we are able to achieve the highest resolution ever done for uh, stimulation in uh, different, uh, different parts of the face. Uh, we can uh, selectively stimulate the whisk whiskers, uh, the facial muscle, the tongue of the, um, uh, of the mouse. And then uh, if we place onto the surface of the uh, of the body, then we can get really high resolution electrical recording. This case is showing uh, uh, individual muscle groups uh, recording using our devices. So currently we are applying this electrode and adding adhesion properties uh, into these electrodes uh, so that then uh, uh, we can build a multi-lead EEG that's wearable and that allows uh, many electrodes uh, to be placed onto our head uh, with uh, only one single uh, component uh, for wireless communication. Uh, second type of sensor I want to talk about is um, this neurochemical sensor. In order to uh, understand reward, uh, addiction, depression, and many um, uh, neural disorder are also uh, impacted by the uh, neurochemical in our brain. And uh, traditionally, the um, uh, such kind of uh, measurement, unless one use uh, genetic targeted uh, uh, fluorescence dyes, uh, but those are still not possible to be applied to human. Uh, currently, what's being used uh, in uh, human without genetic modification is to use um, uh, electrodes such as shown here. This is called carbon fiber, and uh, it's inserted into the brain to perform measurement. Uh, but also our gut 
uh, can have uh, uh, impact on uh, our brain through the uh, vagus nerve um, um, uh, uh, interaction. And uh, the neural chemicals generated in the gut can also impact our brain. It has not yet been possible previously to be able to simultaneously measure the neurochemical both in the gut and in the brain. Uh, and in the gut, you can imagine this kind of hard probe is not possible to be put inside without anesthesia. So it's not possible to really monitor a weak animal uh, in terms of uh, how their neurochemical uh, is, being, um, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, being generated and the, uh, the behavior. Uh, so in our case, um, uh, we developed, uh, again, soft sensor. And this sensor, again, is enabled by new materials we develop. Uh, so here is a carbon-based uh, uh, material. Uh, carbon fiber can, def uh, can sense neurochemical, but the drawback, not only it's rigid, also it has a hard time to differentiate dopamine from serotonin. Uh, so in our sensor here, we generate this, um, uh, uh, this um, uh, hairy uh, carbon material that has embedded um, particles, uh, inorganic catalytic sites, that allows us to build this very soft sensor we call neurostring. Uh, it can be made as thin as um, uh, our, the diameter of our hair, and we can implant it by coating with sugar so that it becomes rigid when we implant, uh, and then insert into the brain, and then the sugar will dissolve and uh, leave behind a very soft neurostring uh, in the brain. Uh, and you can see the electrical signal that we detect for DA is dopamine and uh, 5-HT is serotonin. We can clearly differentiate these two type of uh, neurochemicals, which are important uh, for uh, uh, many of the uh, neuro disorder study. And uh, we uh, have shown uh, with uh, uh, Xiao Chen's group in biology uh, that we're able to see the effect. So here, uh, the uh, um, uh, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor is used uh, to, um, uh, to trigger uh, some changes uh, in the uh, case of animal. And then using optogenetics uh, stimulation, we can then uh, stimulate to generate uh, dopamine or serotonin. And then we track the, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the dynamics of the generation of these neurochemicals. And uh, we were uh, very excited to see that using our neural strain, we can uh, actually uh, uh, be able to observe the difference uh, of uh, serotonin generation with or without the uh, SSRI treatment, uh, which I was told is difficult to do with uh, uh, fluorescence measurement. Um, and also, uh, we were able to implant these neural strain uh, inside the brain for uh, uh, over 16 weeks and allow the animal to move around uh, freely. And uh, the uh, uh, level of uh, dopamine measurement could still stay constant. Uh, this experiment uh, is the first such type of experiment uh, where we have the, a weak animal and uh, with implanted electrodes both in the brain and in the gut. Uh, and then uh, we give the animal uh, chocolate, uh, which with the um, uh, anticipation of eating chocolate, there is a, 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 a spike of the um, uh, serotonin in the brain of the uh, animal. And then in the, um, uh, in the colon, we uh, see the uh, spike of serotonin after uh, about uh, 30, uh, 60 minutes. Uh, that's one uh, the chocolate uh, uh, reaches the, uh, uh, the colon. Uh, and also here you see the, uh, the neural strain uh, inside the intestine, very soft and conformal to the intestine. Uh, so currently we are developing an ingestible version of this kind of uh, um, uh, neurochemical sensor so that it can go into the colon uh, uh, very easily and be able to deploy the, uh, the sensor for measurement. So now going to the wearable system, our 
um, uh, those are uh, tools that are still in early stage development. And uh, going to the wearable monitoring system for mental health, uh, Mentate, uh, we started this development about six years ago with um, um, uh, collaboration with uh, Leanne uh, Williams Group with the ultimate goal to use uh, parameters uh, that are measurable using uh, wearables uh, such as heart rate variability, skin conductance, uh, and also chemical features uh, such as cortisol uh, to, to uh, use these data, hopefully, to see whether there are correlations with the biotypes uh, uh, that she has been working on to determine from the patient uh, for uh, precise uh, treatment. But the uh, most challenging part in building this wearable, uh, that's why it took us so many years and we're still working on it, uh, is the cortisol sensing. Uh, cortisol uh, is this uh, hormone uh, that's uh, related to uh, um, uh, stress. It's called a stress hormone. And um, uh, with, uh, without a chemical uh, signature or biomarker, just based on heart rate variability and skin conductance, it's hard to determine what really triggers um, a, a certain event or, or stress. Uh, adding a stress hormone uh, detection, we hope to be able to, to help with that. Uh, but it's very challenging to detect cortisol uh, in a non-invasive uh, non way and a continuous way. Such sensors do not exist still currently uh, because one, the concentration is very low, nanomolar, equivalent to a pinch of salt throw into a large Olympic size of a swimming pool. Very low concentration. Uh, and uh, also this molecule is not charged. It's very hard to detect it, and it's a very small molecule. There have been attempts to do that. Uh, there are several groups uh, starting to report detection of cortisol uh, from sweat and some from saliva, uh, but none of these are continuous yet. Uh, it's usually taking the sweat sample and then uh, put it onto the wearable to try to measure it. So this is still not a continuous measurement. And um, what we're building uh, is uh, this integrated uh, uh, system uh, where we have um, uh, all the parameters that I mentioned. Uh, actually, this is uh, our current version uh, that we, we have that finally integrated everything. As I mentioned, took us six years. So that's why you see there were several generations of uh, postdocs uh, uh, who worked on this project already uh, moved on to companies or to, um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, become faculty members themselves, uh, but we're still working on it. Uh, and uh, so for, for this case, uh, we are trying to sense um, from sweat. Uh, so we need to develop a continuous uh, sweat generating uh, device. Uh, and that itself uh, turned out to be a huge challenge. Uh, but currently, we do have a sweat stimulating device. Uh, what you are seeing are the, um, uh, the, the channels that collects the sweat. Uh, but we still have to stimulate, um, uh, do electrical stimulation to, uh, to stimulate the sweat to, in order to generate sweat uh, in a more controlled fashion. And then on the uh, right is our uh, cortisol sensor. This little strip can be inserted uh, into the, um, uh, the circuit board so that we can replace it uh, as needed, uh, but keep the circuit board uh, for reusage. Uh, and then uh, the sensor now is able to sense in the nanomolar re uh, range, uh, and we compare with um, uh, actual samples uh, collected um, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, human human sweat and measured by standard ELISA assay, and we found a good correlation with our sensor. 
So we started to do some uh, measurement now, for example, uh, to uh, uh, there's supposed to be a circadian rhythm for uh, cortisol generation. Uh, so we take sweat. Uh, uh, here, we still have to individually uh, stimulate and measure with our mandate. Um, uh, it's not yet possible to do a whole day measurement uh, because the sweat stimulation uh, issue. Uh, but we are able to uh, actually see the circadian rhythm uh, and also cold pressure um, uh, experiment that psychiatrists uh, typically do to uh, induce stress. We can see the cortisol level uh, increase using this. Uh, and we started to uh, perform our um, uh, early measurements uh, using this. Uh, now it's um, uh, coupled with a cell phone uh, and have an app so that we can measure the uh, heart rate, uh, skin conductance, and so on. Uh, and our uh, first study now is um, uh, ongoing. So we started to work with the uh, uh, Liam Williams group using uh, the, um, uh, the first generation uh, to uh, combine with their ketamine study uh, where the patient would also will do both the fMRI scan as well as um, uh, wearing our mandate and start to track um, uh, when the ketamine is injected and, uh, um, uh, and a code presser experiment is being done, what is happening to the various parameters so we can measure. Uh, We're still in the very early stage um, uh, in these measurements, uh, but this is just showing uh, one uh, patient's uh, measurement uh, uh, that the, the darker color indicates uh, uh, some significant change we are tracking using our devices. Uh, there's a huge amount of data that's um, uh, being uh, currently uh, studied and collected. Uh, so there, uh, we're just at the very beginning of um, uh, starting these, um, uh, these experiments uh, and the testing. Um, and next step is to, um, uh, to not only work on the sweat sensing part. Saliva is not possible to be continuous and uh, sweat can be continuous, but we find that there are a lot of uh, difficulties uh, to really continuously generate uh, sweat in a quantitative way. Uh, so we are also building the version that can leverage the glucose sensing monitor uh, that has uh, the, uh, um, the subcutaneous uh, measurement. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'll summarize uh, my talk, uh, and um, our goal is really to move towards uh, developing devices um, uh, that can allow quantitative measurement of uh, mental health. And of course, I uh, couldn't do that uh, can, uh, without all the uh, creative uh, students and postdocs uh, and many collaborators. Um, uh, and this is uh, um, uh, something really, uh, Stanford is the place make it possible to happen. And also a lot of the um, uh, different institutes and seed funding was instrumental. As an engineer, I had no idea about many of these problems until I started working with the collaborators and it's these seed funding allow us to, to build things that now we just, after quite a number of years, we just start to uh, get NSF or starting to apply for NIH. And with that, thank you so much for listening and thanks for your support. Thank you, Professor Bauer, for such uh, truly groundbreaking work and the opportunity to collaborate on such an exciting project. For many of you working in mental health, you'll know that this, the innovation in the design is so critical in that it's comfortable, actually measures, um, takes the signal measurements over time, and it's, it's kind of beautiful design as well, so thank you. I know that we're slightly over time. We're going to shorten the break and still come back at 2.45. So I want to make sure we have time for at least one question if we, okay. So Rachel. Oh, it looks like actually we may have an in-person question. We have an in-person? like to go first. Okay, Walter, please. 
Always very exciting to see your work. I'm curious, in one of your illustrations, you talked about the analytics that go hand in hand with the data collection. Are you thinking of building that on board, or is that something you always transmit to another place to do the computation? Uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the data analysis, uh, whether um, we're going to put it on board or send it to the cloud, um, currently uh, we are our plan is to for the data analysis uh, to um, uh, send the data actually to the cloud for more extensive uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, but we are working with, uh, for example, uh, electrical engineer uh, such as um, uh, uh, such as uh, Mert uh, Plancy from uh, electrical engineering is developing the algorithm uh, to help to process these data uh, with very low power consumption. Uh, and then if that happens, uh, then we can start thinking about putting uh, those algorithms uh, on board. Wonderful. What steps do you have left to do to adapt your technology into the next generation of EEG systems? Uh, oh, uh, can you repeat the Absolutely. beginning? Absolutely. What steps do you have left to do to adapt your technology into the next generation of EEG systems? Mm. Yeah, um, so uh, currently we have the different parts. So we have electrode uh, materials, uh, and we know they are low impedance, uh, but we still need to integrate them onto the um, multi-lead EEG system where uh, the uh, electrode parts, the, the whole body of the EEG is made with soft material. And then on the electronic circuits part, uh, they also have to be designed, this is the co-design problem, they also have to be designed to match our electrodes. So we are working with uh, Ada Pong, uh, who is in electrical engineering, who is designing those uh, silicon chip that can actually process the information from our electrode materials. Have it, we have another one if we have time. Yes. Yeah. How do we handle this issue of wanting to find objective wearable measures of psychiatric disorders, but our training labels are always subjective? Uh, can you repeat again? Yes. Um, in, if you feel that this is uh, better suited for one of our other speakers, please, please let us know. Um, how do we handle the issue of wanting to find objective wearable measures of psychiatric disorders, but our training labels are always subjective, such as PHQ-9s, um, labels, diagnostics from the DSM, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, probably this question is indeed a better <laughs> answered by, uh, by Lee. This, uh, this, is, this is a question we've discussed during the collaboration, and at least one approach we've taken is to add in measures of how the brain's functioning so we can uh, pin down more precise subtypes, which we're referring to as biotypes, mm -hmm. and ask do these incredible new sensors that Professor Bao is developing, do those particularly correlate with one biotype and not another biotype? And then take that to the symptom measures and ask do those correlate with specific symptoms? And so one of our thoughts is that that approach may help shape how we personalize or make more precise wearables in general, and especially ones that are so skin friendly. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Professor Bauer. Wonderful presentation. Thanks.